Exhibitions of industrial produce are not new. They go back to the late 1790s in France, 1798, and then fairly regularly in France through the 1820s, 30s and 40s. But they were always national, one country only. There was one in Bingley Hall in 1849. But that year, John Scott Russell advised Prince Albert that there should be a major exhibition in 1851. And Albert insisted that it must be international. So this is our first international trade show. Location had royal approval. So they, in fact, they used a royal park, Hyde Park. They set up a royal commission with Albert as chair. And as with many of these things, there were no government funds assigned at all to the idea. They had to chase donations. They had to have fundraising events. They had to have dinners. Note that it was in Hyde Park and not Crystal Palace. Part of London nowadays is called Crystal Palace and everyone assumes that that's where the exhibition was built. But the original exhibition was built in Hyde Park. The commissioners set up a competition advertised on the 12th of June 1850 and there were 245 entries designed for a temporary exhibition. The commissioners, quite remarkably, rejected them all, produced a hybrid of their own, cherry-picking what they thought were the best bits, and published this in Illustrated London News, which brought the house down. It was the most horrendous mess. It was largely brick, so hardly a temporary building. It had a dome designed by Brunel, which was larger than St. Peter's in Rome, Various people saw this. Paxton is our man who saved the day. Now, Joseph Paxton was, in fact, the head gardener to the Duke of Devonshire at Chatsworth. And for him, he had already built several glass houses. The earliest one was in 1833. He built another one for him in 34. A much bigger one called the Great Stove, which is started in 36. And finally, one in 1848. And he uses the systems of the architecture, wooden sash bars, ridge and furrow glazing, that is angled glass that in the morning the sun can go through, the afternoon go through, but otherwise it's quite sharp and bounces the light off, and cast iron columns which act as hollow drain pipes. Therefore, Paxton thought he had a kit of parts that was better than anything that he'd seen, and he put in a bid at the last minute. He was au fait with all this. Firstly, for his glass houses, he was using Chance Brothers glass. He knew Robert Lucas Chance in Smethwick. He also knew the contractors of local railways, in particular Fox Henderson, also based in Smethwick. So he knew their works. They were good at erecting structures. So he felt he had a sort of starting point, and he put in a little sketch to the committee who were rather annoyed to have something so late in the day but ahead of the committee's decision he published a view of his design in illustrated london news on the 6th of july 1850 the commissioners were to decide on the 15th of july so he had the public on his side and it went ahead they did agree the contract was verbally assigned on the 26th of July to Fox Henderson, but actually not in writing until October. So they were doing it on a sort of wing and a prayer. They used Smethic contractors, particularly for the ironworks, Cochrane's of Dudley for columns and beams, and Jobson's of Hollyhall also for the castings. Fox Henderson had their own works and they produced some of the smaller ironwork. And Chance Brothers, of course, for the glass. So this is a Midland production. The contract had been assigned on the 26th of July, and they were on site on the 30th, initially laying out the basis for the columns. The size of the building plot is 1,848 by 408 feet. That is 563 by 124 metres. This is four times the size of St Paul's Cathedral, enough to cover Birmingham's International Convention Centre, 
and Symphony Hall and the square beyond in front of the Repertory Theatre and the recently demolished library and the council house all covered under that one building. So this is a very, very large building indeed. The first thing that happened was they put up a wooden fence round the site while they began working on these foundations. And that wooden fence, horizontal boards, they were later used as the floorboards inside the building. There were quite a lot of trees close by and even within the plot they'd chosen, some of which were cut down and some ended up inside the building. John Henderson had suggested a modification to Paxton's original design, which was to add a central barrel vault and that gave extra height for the trees and gave the building really some grandeur. So the ironwork's been cast in Smethwick. The glass is also being made in Smethwick. It comes down by train to Euston and then across London by Pickford's wagons, horse-drawn wagons. Now think of this, 3,230 columns, 2,300 girders. The first one went up on the 26th of September. They've only been on site a few weeks. By this time, there are 400 men working on the site. A month later, the workforce had risen to 1,500, and before the end of the year, there were 2,260. Everything was tested before it was assembled. They had testing rigs for the columns and for the beams, and advanced tests were done about the weights that the beams would stand, the weights the floors would stand, and so on. The barrel vault at the centre of the building had laminated timber arches and the first one went up on the 4th of December. There were 16 in all and the whole lot were done in one week. The superintendent of architecture, Matthew Digby Wyatt, claimed that there were very few accidents. Considering the difficulties of construction, the necessary perils to which the workmen were exposed and their habitual imprudence, arising partly from real indifference to danger and partly from bravado, it has been a source of congratulation that in the performance of this contract but very few accidents have occurred, with two or three exceptions, of a slight nature. But if you read the Expositor, a weekly newspaper about the exhibition, you discover there was in fact a death in December 1850 when a carpenter, Timothy Burns, fell from the scaffold. Once the structure was up, Punch described it as early English shed. as an architectural style. But they started glazing it on the 2nd of November, 1850. In the end, they would use 293,655 sheets of glass. And as the glass started to cover it and the building twinkled in the sunshine, Punch changed its mind and dubbed it Crystal Palace. That's the name that stuck. That's the one we use. This is a giant greenhouse. Victorians wore a lot of clothes. So to cut down the heat and also some of the glare, all the glazing that was vertical on the front of the building, that is facing south, was panelled in wood. In other words, it wasn't glazing, it was solid. And all the flat roofs were covered on the exterior with canvas sheeting, and that then made the whole thing slightly more bearable. They kept daily figures of the temperatures inside and out. 1851 was a very dry, hot summer. June was especially hot. By the 2nd of July, for instance, in 1851, already there'd been 12 days over 24 degrees. And while this work was going on, if you paid five shillings, that's quite a lot of money, you could go round the building works Typically, there'd be a 1,000 a day doing this. The highest was 3,000 in one day in early February 1851. So the building is getting glazed. We then have a sort of wind and weather tight place. Remember, though, there were trees inside under the barrel vault, and in those trees were birds nesting. And they realised that they still had them in the building when it was nearly completely glazed, and they needed to get rid of them. So... The workmen were given bird-scaring rattles. We would recognise them today as football rattles. And they started at one end of the building, making lots of noise, walking down the central aisle and scaring the birds ahead of them. 
the birds flew right down to the far end of the building, then up over their heads and back again. So that didn't work. This went on for a while, and Queen Victoria got to hear about the problem. And she said, I know a man who will have an answer. And she had a word with the Duke of Wellington. And he's reputed to have said, try sparrowhawks, ma'am. And the sparrowhawks were brought in and they duly dispatched the sparrows. And that was all solved. I wonder how you get rid of the sparrowhawks. Do you send in something bigger? Try eagles, ma'am. Anyway, it's quite possibly not a true story, but it has stuck it keeps being repeated time and time again. So we have a wind and weather type building in the main area, largely without birds. Then everything has to be painted. Painting took a long time. In fact, painting was still going on in mid-April. And largely the painting was done from ladders. It wasn't done from scaffold. The colour scheme was chosen by Owen Jones, the superintendent of works. And he used blue, red and yellow, in the proportions, he claimed, as they appear in nature. And he claimed that that was eight of blue, five red and three of yellow. I have no idea where he got this idea from. And curiously, every colour was separated from the next by a band of white. So it was a very, very complicated painting job and it took a lot of time. We have a long exhibition building with a central transept. So it's basically cross-shaped, but it's very long on the axis. And half the building is going to be dedicated to Britain and its dominions, and the other half of the building to the rest of the world. In 1851, that's a fair distribution of the industrialised opportunity for exhibits. So exhibits were shipped from all over the world, starting in November 1850, and the deadline of the last deliveries was the middle of April. Queen Victoria noted in her diary that when she visited the construction site, there was still nothing from Russia. The noise was tremendous, as there was so much going on of all kinds and sorts, and at least twelve to 20,000 engaged in work of every kind. Russia is far behindhand, as the ships were frozen in and could not bring the thing sooner. The deadline for all this is the 1st of May, the opening ceremony. Visitors were now coming into London and coming from all over the world. There's lots of stuff in the paper about the worries they might have from foreigners, and Cruikshank does some rather rude satirical cartoons about them. There's a lovely one about a group of foreigners having hired the last tent on the roof of a house and the visitors from England are being offered a hammock in the cellar because that's all that's left. In fact, people did travel from all over the world, but especially from all over the country. There were, in the end, over six million visitors. Now, that's at a time when the population of the whole country is 18 million. That's incredible. And they do that because... If they're working, very often the companies would have set up saving clubs and they're putting a penny or sixpence aside a week for many, many months and then buying a rail excursion and accommodation, rail excursion organised by a man called Thomas Cook, who later on became quite well known for this business, but that's where he started. There was an example visiting in June of three whole parishes from Kent and Surrey, 800 people this was, all who had got up at five in the morning, walked to the nearest railway station, had a train into London, walked from Victoria up to Hyde Park and seen the exhibition. And that happened to be a day when Queen Victoria was there. And so she mentioned in her diary. On the morning of the 12th, we saw three whole parishes, Crowhurst, Lynchfield and Langford from Kent and Surrey, 800 in number, go by walking in procession two and two, the men in smock frocks, with their wives looking so nice. Six million people is a vast amount. There were 141 viewing days. The exhibition opened to the public from the 2nd of May to the 11th of October. It was a Monday to Saturday affair. It was closed on a Sunday. This is Victorian England. Nothing happens on a Sunday. Differential pricing 
made it very expensive in the first few days. So, for instance, the first two days, it was a pound a head. Now, the inflation factor for 1851 is 112 times, so it's an expensive item. And in those two days, you got 16,000 people. Those were the first paying days. Prior to that had been the grand opening ceremony when there were 25,000 people in there, but those were season ticket holders and dignitaries. A season ticket was three guineas. A guinea is 21 shillings, one pound, one shilling. Three guineas at today's prices is about 350 pounds. Interestingly, for men it was three guineas, but for women it was only two guineas. And they were used an average of 30 times each. So very expensive right at the beginning, quite elitist. And then after three weeks, the prices come down from Monday to Thursday, from the 26th of May onwards, it was a shilling. That's £5.60 today's prices. And there were 82 shilling days. As time went on and the exhibition got more and more popular, more and more people tried to come on the shilling days. A total of 4,439,419 visitors came on shilling days. If we went round the exhibition on that day, we would only see people. And it got worse because the last Thursday, the last shilling day, the 9th of October, there were 109,915 visitors in the building. If you had a choice, you should go round on a five shilling day when there'd only be 15, 16,000 and you'd get to see quite a lot. When Queen Victoria went round did the first ever royal walkabout on the opening day on the 1st of May, she said she couldn't see anything other than what was above their heads. An average of 55,000 people in on one day and many people spending five or six hours there. By the way, the exhibition was opened from nine in the morning till six in the evening. Only daylight hours, there was no artificial lighting in there. Some of them will have needed to go to what was euphemistically called comfort stations or waiting rooms. Waiting because with 55,000 people and only 24 gents and 24 ladies toilets near the entrance and about the same amount again further down at the far end of the exhibition, there was not a great provision. So you did a lot of waiting rather than actually using the facilities. The facilities were put in by George Jennings. He said he would install them and have them staffed and cleaned and sorted, but he wanted to put a slot machine on the door and you had to put a penny in the slot to open the toilet. So the phrase spending a penny actually originates from the 1851 exhibition. And Mr. Jennings made a profit of £1,769. So he recorded 827,280 customers. That's about one in seven of the visitors. I'm not sure what the rest did. Probably don't want to know. There were also refreshments provided. There were three refreshment courts. One was opposite the main entrance. And the other two were on the north side and actually had open trees. So all this nonsense about trying to get the birds out, the roof in those places were open to the sky. So there were always birds in the building. The contract for refreshments was awarded to a Mr. Schwepp. A catering franchise was worth £5,500 and he sold, obviously, fizzy drinks, as we know that name, one million ninety-two thousand three hundred and thirty-seven fizzy drinks Having paid 5500 he made 45000 profit, over £5.4 million at today's prices, so very nice. And we know exactly what he sold because there are full details of the amounts of bath buns, of plain buns, of banbury cakes, of macaroons, how many coffees, how much raw material of coffee and where it was sold, chocolate, cream and soda water and so on. The opening ceremony was on the 1st of May, 1851, at midday. Queen Victoria, Prince Albert, and two of their children entered the building through the north end of the transept. That's a sort of private entrance for the Queen. And she regularly used that entrance. She came to the exhibition 41 times. If you want a guide to take you around the exhibition, ask Queen Victoria. There were 
some 25,000 people waiting. And after a proclamation and a singing of the Hallelujah Chorus, she and Albert then did the first ever royal walkabout. They walked along the British nave, that is going due west. They got to the far end, turned around and came back again to where they'd started from and then went all the way down the foreign nave and back again. And she commented as to how long it took to do this. The nave was full of people, which had not been intended, and deafening cheers and waving of handkerchiefs continued the whole time of our long walk from one end of the building to the other. As she started walking down the British nave, a Chinese Mandarin came up and bowed, and she was very touched by this. She carried on her walk, and he reappeared. He'd scooted ahead of her and did it again. And he did this several times, and every time she took it in very good faith, happy to see him. Afterwards, the newspapers delved a little bit more into who this man was, and he turned out not to be an important person, not to be a government delegate. He was simply a captain of a ship, a Chinese junk, which was moored in the Thames, who had borrowed a fine robe, come on up, and basically gate-crashed the party. The building contract had cost £79,800. Now, that's about £9.5 million at today's prices. On top of that, there was the fitting out, the staffing, the security, catalogue printing, medals, which were cast on the exhibition, and all that came to a further £255,942. So a total of £335,742. That's a little over £40 million at today's prices. It's incredibly good value. That's the cost, 335000 But the receipts from the gate money came to £522,179. That's a profit of £186,436. That's a vast amount. And out of this went £5,000 as a gift to Joseph Paxton. That's about £600,000 at today's prices. And on the 23rd of October, after the exhibition closed, he was knighted along with Thomas Cubitt, who was the chairman of the building committee, and Charles Fox of Fox Henderson. A scholarship scheme was set up, which is still operating today, but the bulk went to purchase 87 acres of South Kensington. That became the home to the second London International Exhibition of 1862, on the site of what's now the Natural History Museum. It became the home of the Victorian Albert Museum, the Science Museum, the Geological Museum, Imperial College, the Royal College of Music, and various other ones. Oh, and a little thing called the Albert Hall, all on that site, all from the profit of the exhibition. So incredibly successful, very quick, and the first of many. Everybody wanted to have an international exhibition of that same stature in other countries and then followed more and more around the world. There had been no fee to exhibit. 7,000 items were selected by local committees. In fact, 330 local committees across Britain. £100,000 worth of exhibits were presented to the nation, became the core of what's now the Victoria and Albert Museum and the Science Museum. The building was temporary and it was dismantled in 1852 and they started re-erecting it at Sydenham, the place we now call Crystal Palace. Some of the exhibits were temporarily displayed in Marlborough House on the Mall near Buckingham Palace in 1852. A permanent exhibition opened in South Kensington in 1853. The Albert Hall followed and new art schools also were developed over the country funded by the profits from the exhibition. So we have lots of legacies. One of the most interesting ones perhaps is excursion travel and also the idea of differential prices that you can pay higher prices for a sort of more exclusive visit. Six million visitors in five and a half months. That's incredibly successful. And at only 40 million pounds, a fraction of the cost of something like Wembley Stadium today. <laughs> 